Hi, everyone. This is Lauren Steiner with The Robust Opposition, and I'm really excited to bring you this episode tonight because I have as my very special and only guest, Levi Tilleman. And Levi Hi, Tilleman. Hi, Levi. He is the subject of an explosive article that came out in The Intercept this past Wednesday in which he secretly taped Steny Hoyer, who is the um, minority whip of the Democratic Party in Congress, basically asking him to get out of the race. Um, before I get into my questions, let me just give you a brief bio of, of uh, Levi, because he is running for Congress in Colorado's sixth district. And he's running against Mike Kaufman is a Republican, uh, but he's also running against the establishment Democrat, Jason Crow, who we'll talk about in a couple minutes. Levi is from the Denver area and he went to Regis and then to Yale and he did his PhD at Johns Hopkins. And um, while he was doing that, he started an uh, energy um, car company. And uh, he was an advisor to Obama's energy department. And he wrote a book called The Great Race, The Global Quest for the Car of the Future. And he's now a managing partner at Bal Balance Strategic. So before I get into the Intercept article, what is uh, Valance Strategic? So Valence Strategic is a company that I started with a couple of my colleagues from the Obama administration. I started the first group at the Obama Energy Department focusing on autonomous vehicles and studying the changes that were going to come to our society and our culture and our energy system as a result of autonomous vehicles. And when I left to publish this book, The Great Race, The Global Quest for the Car of the Future, I realized that autonomous vehicles were just one part of a huge universe of technologies that were going to have some pretty profound implications for, for our society and our economy. And, and those were really technologies that focused on artificial intelligence and robotics. So we did the three things that were kind of my specialty. We focused on renewable energy, including clean energy technologies like electric cars, robotics, and artificial intelligence. And, and we helped um, big countries, Japan and Germany, and, and some big companies like Toyota, and then a bunch of startup companies, as well as some NGOs that focused on environmental issues, figure out how they were going to interface with this new world of artificial intelligence and automation going forward. Well, I notice you have some really interesting policies on your issue page relating to uh, both uh, climate change and robotics and artificial intelligence. And we'll be getting into that in the second half of the program. But right now, I want to talk about this, um, this interview that you taped with Steny Hoyer. What gave you the idea to, uh, to secretly tape this meeting? How did you set up the meeting? And tell the viewers all the things that the Democratic Party have done leading up to this meeting that caused you, that caused your frustration and caused you to tape it in the first place. Well, the meeting really came to me. We were very concerned because we had noticed a pattern of establishment figures taking meetings with us or in some cases reaching out to us for meetings and then telling us one thing behind closed doors and doing something very different in public and, and frequently not, um, not keeping their word when it came to uh, staying out of the internal mechanics of the six congressional districts Democratic primary. And so that, that happened enough times that when we had Steny Hoyer reach out and say, I'm in town and I'd like to sit down with you, we knew more or less what Hoyer was going to talk to me about. Uh, we suspected that he was going to try to push me out of the race. We knew that he was in town doing fundraisers for my Democratic opponent. And we just decided, you know what, fool me once, shame on me. Fool, uh, excuse me, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And, you know, it had been two or three times and we just decided that we needed to cover our backs on this one. Now, you just started to sound like George Bush when you uh, 
<laughs> mangled that quote. But anyway, well, for the viewers who have not read that article, what did Steny Hoyer tell you in that meeting? Well, it was actually a selection from a longer conversation that we had, but I will say that it was not misleading in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, we, we discussed a lot of different things, and what I asked The Intercept was to focus on the newsworthy elements within the conversation and not focus on uh, and anything personal that, that we might discuss. And so that is what we did. And overwhelmingly, it was Steny Hoyer telling me that a decision had been made by people who were you know, above my pay grade that Jason Crow was going to be the candidate for the sixth congressional district. And he told me that that decision had been made very, very early on. And I said, yeah, it seems like it had been made, you know, maybe at the beginning of 2017. And he said, I don't care if it was made while Morgan Carroll was still running. Um, and, and Morgan Carroll was the previous Democratic candidate for the district. He said, we decided who the candidate was going to be, and we decided to get in hard and early behind this individual. I took exception and I said, Congressman Hoyer, that is not a very Democrat approach to executing a Democratic primary. Wouldn't it be better to have all of the candidates um, get access to equal resources and prosecute their case with the voters and let the voters decide? And Hoyer, just acted like this was an extremely naive assumption on my part. And, and I'll just say, if believing in democratic values is naive, then call me naive. Um, I think that we need to have free and fair elections, and I believe in that. And that's why I got into this in the first place, because I believe that Donald Trump is threatening the fundamental values and principles of our democracy, and I wanted to fight back against that. And I'm not going to accept it when my own political party bends or breaks those principles. In his farewell address, President Obama told Americans that if they were fed up, they should go out and run for office. If you're disappointed by your elected officials, grab a clipboard, get some signatures, and run for office yourself. And in the Trump era, thousands of Democrats have heeded his call, running for office in elections across the country. Meanwhile, in the race for Congress, the DCCC, or the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, has moved aggressively to crush competitive primaries. DCCC officials and senior Democrats are hand-picking moderate, business-friendly candidates and are attempting to push progressives out of key races. In Colorado's 6th District, one of the most competitive seats in the country, the DCCC moved in early to select Jason Crow, a corporate lawyer, as the party candidate pushing resources, endorsements, and money to Crow while elbowing out progressive Democratic competitors. The Democratic Party often denies that they play favorites. What follows is a meeting between Congressman Steny Hoyer, the number two Democrat in the House, and Levi Tilleman, a progressive running for the nomination for the Colorado seat. Levi, I want to, obviously I want to talk to you about this congressional race. Absolutely, that's what I expected. Yeah. You would like me to get out of the race. And you keep saying, I would like you to get out. And of course, that's, that's correct. Yeah. And I know you're fundraising for Crow. Yeah. You know? I'm for Crow. I am for Crow because a judgment was made very early on. I didn't participate in the decision. So your position is a decision was made, you know, very early on before voters had a say. That's fine because that's the DCCC knows better than the voters of the 6th Congressional District, and we should line up behind that candidate. That's certainly a consequence of our decision. There are two things I'd like you to consider. One may be easier than the other. The first would be, uh, if you stay in the race, mm -hmm. frankly, I would hope you would not. I'll get to that. But if you stay in the race, it is not useful to the objective to tear down Crow. Mm -hmm. Crow is clearly the favorite. That doesn't mean you win. It just means he's the favorite. I hear you. That doesn't mean it's right. It just means no. no, I hear you. But I don't know Crow well, but I think he's a decent human being. So before we before we go any further on that, Crow is the favorite. 
in no small part, Congressman Hoyer, because the DCCC not only put its finger on the scale, but started jumping on the scale very early on. And I'm born and raised a Democrat. I mean, it's undemocratic to have a small elite select someone and then try to rig the primary against the other people running. And that is, that is basically what's been happening. I hear you, and I disagree. But you were part of that process Absolutely. as well. You said absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I've been at this a long time. Yeah. Uh, when I said you need to get in strong, hard, and early, you just do it. You know, obviously, that's your choice. And you guys are shoveling money at him. I'm going to continue. You're going to continue to do it? We are going to continue to do it. And the reason why we're going to do it is because a decision was made to focus. It was clear that was our policy and our hope that we could early on try to come to an agreement on a candidate that we thought could win the judgment mm -hmm. and to give that candidate all the help we could give them so that we would have a unified effort going into a general election. Which, which means effectively, Congressman Hoyer, I'm running a campaign against Crow and against you and against the DCCC because you guys are on Crow's side. Yeah. You know, frankly, that happens in life all the time. Now, you said to him, not only did you put your finger on the scale, you jumped on the scale. You started jumping on the scale really early on. And he was mentioning that it had to do with local Democratic Party officials. So my next question to you is, why don't the local Democratic Party officials like you? Is it because you're too progressive? Um, you know, I, I don't think it actually had anything to do with me. I don't think most of them knew that I was running at that point in time. Uh, he referenced a very specific universe of people. and. There's no way that most of those people could have known that I was running when they quote unquote made that decision. Uh, but to me, that really gets to a bigger problem, which is that these decisions are being made, they're being front loaded very, very early on before voters get a chance to really know who the candidates are and what they stand for. And that's not how it should be. Well, you know, we saw this with the Democratic primary with Bernie Sanders in 2016. We saw how the system is rigged against um, progressives. We've been seeing it for the candidates who are running in 2018. I mean, they even, the DCCC went as far as to, to publish opposition research <clears throat> against Laura Moser, who is a progressive Democrat running in Texas. Now, mm -hmm. After, in fact, after this uh, article came out in The Intercept on Wednesday, Dave Weigel had an article in The Washington Post in which he interviewed Nancy Pelosi and she defended it. How did you feel about that? And, and did uh, Steny Hoyer call you afterwards to comment on your secretly taping him? No, nobody has been in touch, but I do think that Nancy Pelosi should reevaluate some of her values and principles. Um, I, I thought that her response to that question was inappropriate and quite frankly, it's damaging to her own party. Um, this is not acceptable. It's not how we should be doing things. It's not democratic. And if we keep going down this road, it's just going to further alienate really good progressive people and people who just believed in believe in the fundamental principles of democracy who might otherwise be on our side. Well, you know, this is already happening and I'm going to read you uh, some polls that came out today uh, or that I just read today. They were recently published. A new USA Today Suffolk University poll showed that two thirds of people will stay away from the polls during the midterms and the majority of them would like to see a third party. A Reuters Ipsos poll of 16,000 registered voters between 18 and 34 showed that support for Democrats has dropped 9% from two years ago 
to 46 percent. They say that Republicans are actually a better steward of the economy. Two thirds of them don't like Trump, but that doesn't translate to all Republicans or into votes for Democratic congressional candidates. Now, I say it's because the party has not learned its lesson from 2016. They continue to be the not Trump party without offering a positive program. Um, so we're going to get into your positive program after I ask you the next question, which is, um, why don't you just leave the party and go independent like Tim Canova did? Well, I... I really do believe that in order to change Washington, we have to have people in Washington who will stand up and fight for these values. And it is really, really hard to win an election if you're outside of the two-party system. And, and that is unfortunately a harsh fact of life. Um, I was born and raised a Democrat. I do believe in most of the values espoused by the Democratic platform. I would say that the Democratic platform aligns with, with my personal beliefs pretty well. I probably go a step further on a number of things, um, very strong on renewable energy, on making sure that kids have access to the best education and that college students aren't buried in debt. I also think that we've seen a consolidation of the economy that's dangerous and we need to do something about that. And so I'm, I'm certainly more aligned with the economically progressive wing of the Democratic Party than I am with the centrist part of the Democratic Party. But, you know, we need to have people who are part of the process, who can be powerful voices for progressive causes. And, and I think it's really important that we have people like Bernie Sanders and people like Elizabeth Warren in Congress today. And I hope to join them, not because I have a burning desire to go back to Washington. I much prefer living in Colorado, actually. But we do need good people weighing in when these decisions are made. Well, I had a chance to peruse your issue page. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about some of your positions. You had a really, really good gun control platform. You had some very specific solutions. It's kind of what the Parkland students are calling for and what all good progressives are calling for. But I imagine there's a lot of people in the state of Colorado that have guns that like their guns. And I'm wondering how well that's going over with them. Well, I, I think that we live in a district that has had a number of unique and terrible tragedies that were associated with people having access to weapons that they simply shouldn't have ever had access to. And I believe that in the sixth congressional district, um, you know, real, reasonable, and fairly aggressive gun control measures are going to be quite popular in 2018. And the truth is I came to these policies before the Parkland massacre, and that's one thing that really sets me apart from the other Democrat who's running. Um, you know, I, I won't go into it, but I will just say that we've been very consistent on these issues throughout. We had a tragic death in our district on December 31st, and we put out a very strong statement thereafter, and we called for a very specific set of policies thereafter. And my Democratic opponent sort of pivoted where he was on gun control issues um, strongly after the Parkland massacre. And I just think that if we haven't learned from the lessons of Columbine and the Aurora Theater shooting and the Copper Canyon shooting, on December 31st of last year, then, then you know, who are we? We've seen enough and it's time for change. Wow, yeah, I completely forgot your district, Aurora, is exactly where they had that shooting. So yeah, Jason Crow is a corporate lawyer. He's defended payday lenders. He's defended a gun lobbyist. He's defended frackers, which uh, leads me to my next question. You know, you, you talk about climate change and you talk about how we have to get to 100% clean energy by 2035, which is awesome. Um, it's a little sooner than a lot of other progressives have asked for, and I totally agree with that. But nowhere on your issue page do you say that you're opposed to fracking. What's your stance on fracking? Because in my, from what I know, I work with a lot of fractivists in Colorado. They say that fracking is decimating 
at stake. Yeah, it's, it's really problematic. My grandma lives in the south of Colorado near a town called La Vida. And there's a lot of um, what, what we call unconventional natural gas fracking that's going on in the south of Colorado. And we've seen it with our own eyes. Uh, we've seen how crystal clear streams have turned into cloudy, polluted brooks. Um, when I fly over the Western United States, one of the things that I do that probably most people who are not as engaged with the energy industry um, would do is I, I look down and, and I look for the fracking well pads that you can see carpeted over huge swaths of the Western United States and especially Western Colorado. And that, you know, it bothers me. There's an enormous amount of habitat destruction there. So I've signed on to the OFF Act and the OFF Act calls for an end to fracking. And so that is that is part of my platform. And um, I, I guess we should make that more explicit on our web page. Uh, we've been very strong on environmental issues since day one. My background is in clean energy. I fought for a cleaner, a cleaner world and a better uh, policy on climate change issues um, for my entire life, and I promise I'll continue to do that when I go to Washington. Yeah, I just read a very lengthy article in the Boulder Weekly, which was about you had some great uh, ballot initiatives in 2014 that was being financed by Jared Polis, and he was part of that gang of four in Colorado, four very mm -hmm. liberal, uh, you know, millionaires, maybe even billionaires, I'm not sure, who basically came up with a successful plan to take Colorado blue again, and they yes, did. Yes, one of them is one of my big supporters, actually. He's a terrific guy. Who's that? Uh, his name is Rupp Bridges. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, it was a very successful plan, and they did it by not discussing issues. They just talked about mm. get Democrats back. And um, mm. what happened was, you know, Polis uh, sort of bankrolled this uh, initiative campaign and people worked on it for years and then in the end in the last minute he pulled it and um, because he worked out a compromise with Governor Hickenlooper who we like to call Governor Frackenlooper because he sued five Colorado communities for banning fracking and mm -hmm. uh, I guess this compromise was to get them to back down on suing these communities and also they wanted a 2,000 foot setback from all homes, businesses, and um, uh, schools, and they got the, they got it to a 1,000 foot setback. Um, so, do, do you remember? Were you active in 2014 when that was going down, and did you play a role in this at all? You know, I wasn't particularly involved in that issue. I was focused more on electric vehicles at the time and making sure that we had supportive policy structures for electric vehicles. But I do have to say, I, I was aware of what was happening. I was aware that the state was suing these communities and I found it to be really kind of outrageous. And the problem is that there's a long history of the courts ruling against property owners and for the owners of the mineral rights that are associated with that same geography. And, and that goes back, uh, I, I, I have to look at the exact dates, but more than a hundred years. Um, and so we are dealing with a very old and developed set of case law. And, and that is going to be a challenge for us as we push back against this really reckless endangerment of our homes and communities. Yeah, that's really funny because you articulated exactly uh, what I asked John Hickenlooper about at our reunion. It was my 30th college reunion and his 35th, and he was on a panel talking about how the marijuana thing was going. And I asked him a fracking question. I said, okay. why, why are you more concerned with protecting the mineral rights of the, um, uh, of the frackers than you are with the health rights of the citizens? And he mm -hmm. answered, he literally went on for six and a half minutes. I have it on my YouTube channel. Obviously, he's answered this question before and unsatisfactorily to me, but, um, mm -hmm. You know, apparently there's just a, a lot of oil and gas money in Colorado, and it's really hard to um, <clears throat> get around it. My next question is about um, college, because you talk about um, wanting to increase funding for vocational and community college, but you do not say that you support 
tuition-free public college and university. Mm -hmm. So do you? Public yeah, I do. I do. Um, I, I do. And, uh, and you know, I, I, I have thought about this quite extensively. And the fact is, if, if your family makes less than $120,000 a year, it is just crippling to pay for college for, for your kids. And, you know, I'm someone who took on an enormous amount of student debt when I went to college because I have 10 brothers and sisters and we didn't have a lot of money. And so, yeah, so I came from a big family. And so each of us had to take on loans to pay for our own education. And I still have my loans from, from graduate school. I think I've paid off the ones from college, but just, just a year or two ago. And so I really sympathize with the plight of working class and middle class Americans who want their kids to have a better future, who want their kids to be able to go through that gateway to opportunity, but don't want to be weighed down by $100,000 or in some cases $200,000 in student debt. And so I think making sure that, that community and public colleges are available and not just affordable, but, but, but truly accessible to people who don't have a lot of money, um, that, that's a really important responsibility of the state. Yes, now about student debt, I don't know if you know this, but um, the US government makes $46 billion a year on interest from student debt. And a lot mm -hmm. of people feel they shouldn't be <laughs> making money off of students. They should either have mm -hmm. zero interest loans or they should be providing free public college and university. What would be your position on that were you to be elected to Congress? Yeah, I would say the United States government shouldn't make one cent off of students who are taking out educational loans for a better future. Um, that is a predatory institution and the United States government should not be involved in it. And part of what I'm fighting against is making sure that we do have a level playing field, that we're not being in a rigged economy. And that, that has to start in Washington, D.C. And so that's why I've called very openly for the U.S. government to um, make sure that it's not making a penny off of kids who are taking out loans to try to finance their education and, and, and move towards a better future. Right. <clears throat> now, um, speaking of the system being rigged, uh, we know that's because that money has an outsized interest in politics. And millionaires and billionaires, millionaires and billionaires, I have to do my Bernie imitation, <laughs> are, are contributing to these candidates on both sides of the aisle. And you mm. talk about Lawrence Lessig, who's great, and his anti-corruption act. And you talk about perhaps everyone should be given $25 to give to a qualifying campaign. And that's great. We need campaign finance reform. But um, don't say in your um, on your issues page relating to that that you think that Citizens United should be overturned. So I want to just get that clarification from you. Uh, well, that's that one's easy. Yeah, that's a slam dunk. Yeah. And I think we have to go further than that. Um, Citizens United is a very small part of the problem. It is it's a big problem. But the bigger problem is that I think it's only 002 percent of of Americans contribute to a political primary. And that means that it's really 0.02% of Americans are deciding who goes to Washington. And that's why Washington never changes. And so we need to make sure that not just is United, but the overall campaign finance system is reformed and that normal people, working Americans, have a voice in who we select to go into the general elections in our in our various congressional districts and who goes to Washington. Because if you're not paying a, playing a role in the primary, then you're really not picking who goes to Washington at the end of the day. Yes, well, as you can see from that recent poll, people are very disillusioned and are not participating. So I think it's gonna take a sea change. Also, we need to overturn Buckley versus Vallejo, which was the 1976 decision that said money equals speech. And mm -hmm. this was very corrupting even before Citizens United because it enabled rich people to basically pay for their own campaigns, which many of them are doing. 
Um, another thing that really impressed me about your website was you talked about antitrust and monopolization is something that Bernie Sanders never talked about. And I believe that it is the real cause of um, wealth and income inequality, because when you have five companies controlling the airlines, five companies controlling the media, five companies controlling big food, et cetera, et cetera, you are not giving uh, consumers or labor any kind of buying power or bargaining power. And Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so you say that we should re-examine the impacts of economic consolidation, but what actual policies would you propose after we re-examine that? So uh, let me just start by saying that I don't think any has spoken more eloquently on these topics in recent memory than Tom Periello. And what Periello spoke about was economic consolidation and automation. And those are two issues that I've been really focused on. And I was just so thrilled to hear him come out as a strong voice for reform in these two areas. Consolidation is basically the shift from Main Street to big box stores to online retailers like Amazon. And every step along the way, communities lose jobs. And every step along the way, consumers lose power. And every step along the way, municipalities lose tax revenues. And so economic consolidation is a huge problem. Um, automation is the, the situation we find ourselves in where jobs that used to be considered uniquely human, something like driving a car, are going to be done by robots in the relatively near future. And that means that we are at risk of hemorrhaging millions and millions of jobs throughout the economy, jobs that people didn't used to think could be automated. We've already been through one massive wave of automation, uh, which took place in factories and, and along assembly lines. And you know, I think the, the best estimates are that since the 1990s, the vast majority of the jobs that we've lost in this country's factories were not lost to foreign trade. They were lost to robots. I think it's something like 88, 90%. But that's going to get worse going forward. And that trend is going to expand into the entire economy. And so that's something that we have to prepare for. And that's something that I really want to focus on when I go to Washington, D.C. Um, now, you, you asked what specific policies I would promote. I think one of the things we have to look at is the definition of what it means to be in, in the public interest. Uh, it used to be that the only thing that was considered is whether an economic consolidation, a merger um, or an acquisition was going to raise the price of a good or service. And, and that was kind of how regulators decided, is this in the public interest or is it not in the public interest? But with automation and with artificial intelligence and consolidation working together, we could find ourselves in a situation where Lots of goods and lots of services are extremely cheap, but nobody has any money to pay for them. And the decimation of the middle class would be a horrible thing for American society. And so that's why I think we need to start looking at some of these historical interpretations of the public interest and, and then, and then you know, reinterpret them for the 21st century because our world is changing. And, and that body of law needs to change with it. Well, you also talk about the universal basic income, which is an idea that I remember studying in college in the late 70s, and something mm -hmm. was first championed by Richard Nixon, of all people. It was brought to his attention by Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and the idea would be that everybody would get a floor income of $12,000, which is the poverty level, so it's not enough to make you want to not work uh, because you'll barely get by on that, but it's something to keep you from being homeless on the streets. What do you want to say about that or any other idea? Yeah, isn't it funny how much this country has lurched to the right? Uh, Richard Nixon signed into law the Environmental Protection Agency. Gerald Ford signed into law our country's first fuel economy standards. And Richard Nixon was looking at things like universal basic income decades and decades ago. Now, I think universal basic income is a really exciting opportunity 
to deal with some of the issues that are going to result from automation and economic consolidation. And I think we need to get a better understanding of what it's going to look like. So one of the things that I've proposed is that we do a relatively large study of how universal basic income like human health and education and um, people's, people's psychological well-being. Uh, so I'd like to see a 5,000 person study where we create that floor that you're discussing. We make sure that those people don't go below the poverty threshold. And then we see what happens with, with that subset of people who are able to benefit from that universal basic income. And then I think we can make further policy after that. But I, I'm always a big believer in taking good ideas, testing them aggressively, and then looking at the data and, and figuring out you know, what the data tells us about that exciting new idea. So I, you know, even though I'm a very progressive person, I, I consider myself um, someone who's not an ideologue. Um, I consider myself someone who's very data driven. And then sometimes we don't have the data that we need. And so we need to make the data. And I'm not against making that data. Sometimes we have to take bold initiatives to figure out what we don't know. Well, Ro Canna had a very good idea, which he uh, expressed on my show. He's a congressman from uh, Northern California. Yeah, I'm very familiar with him. Silicon Valley. He talked about, you know, there's a lot of jobs that we can't outsource, and a lot of them are provided by the federal government, even though Trump is trying to eliminate them. But he talked about taking jobs out of some of our major cities and moving them into the heartland of the country, um, because, uh -huh. really, you know, the heartland of the country has been hollowed out by these free trade agreements. And um, even though Trump said he was going to get, he got us out of the TPP, it looks like he's now looking into getting back into it, of course, because he's going back on many of the things that he said. And even his tariffs on steel and aluminum, he just postponed them for another six months. But um, I wanted to talk to you about um, foreign policy because your, your grandfather was Tom Lantos, who is a giant uh, in the human rights area. He was, uh, when he was head of the Foreign uh, Services Committee, he um, advocated against all the genocides and um, all of our humanitarian inventions, interventions. And yet he did support the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War. So I wanted to know your position on foreign affairs, American imperialism, and what you think should be America's role in the world. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I loved my grandfather. He had a really big impact on me. And one thing that I learned, especially as I got older, is you can respect someone, you can learn from someone, and you don't always have to agree with them. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go down and, and make a list of all the areas that I didn't agree with him, but I will just say um, he, was, he was pretty hawkish and he was overly hawkish. And, and that was problematic. And, you know, I, I had a lot of, um, you know, pretty intense conversations with him about the Iraq war and why he supported some of the things he supported. And, and, you know, I think that his perspective came from his unique experience as a Holocaust survivor. He was in Europe as the Nazis rolled through community after community of his friends and neighbors and relatives and gutted and exterminated the, the Jewish uh, communities of, of Eastern and Central Europe. And I can only imagine what it felt like to sit there and realize that there's a country called the United States of America that has the power to potentially intervene on your behalf and it's doing nothing. And so, you know, I think my grandfather had a very strong bias towards action. And that strong bias towards action came from watching the Western world sit back and do nothing as his family and friends were exterminated by the Nazis. Um, and so I, I understand his perspective. And the interesting thing is he represented one of the more liberal districts in this country. And his constituents also understood his perspective because at the end of the day, 
we're all the product of our own set of experiences. And he was the product of watching almost his entire family be wiped out as, as many people in the world sat back and did nothing. And so I think that's where his bias towards action came from. And I will, I will just say that I think the United States has taken it too far. And I think that Congress needs to reassert its control over America's ability to wage war. And we can't have a situation where um, a president, and in, in this case, a president who is unstable and a criminal, and I would say a, a thinly veiled fascist, can go around the world and, and shoot off missiles at whoever he wants, whenever he wants. Um, we, we need to have a rebalancing, and, and that's, that's really important. So, um, you know, I, I think uh, foreign policy is a big topic. And you can't possibly cover all of it in a short conversation. Okay, well, real quickly, yeah. do you think that Russia uh, colluded with Trump to hack our election and that um, Assad did chemical attacks on his own people? I do believe that Russia colluded with the Trump administration to hack into our election. I, I think that the, the evidence is pretty persuasive at this point, and it is multi-sourced and as someone who's a writer and an author and has investigated um, uh, technologies and history and and you know how you can figure out whether something is true or not true the what what, what they would call multi-stream source intelligence that we have with respect to Russia playing a, a really uh, perverse role in the 2016 election is quite compelling as far as I'm concerned. And what about Assad, these chemical attacks, the ones that Trump responded to? Do you think he was behind them? I have no reason to believe he wasn't. Um, I'd be interested to hear any other theories you might have. Okay, well, we can do that at another time. But my okay. final question is about your campaign. Somebody said, so he's taking big money. I don't think I said anything or you said anything to indicate that you're taking big money. So why no. don't <laughs> I haven't taken a single dollar of PAC money, and so I'm not sure what that, that really means, uh, that I'm taking big money. Um, we have raised all of our funds from individuals, uh, except for um, I, there, there was one uh, former congressional candidate who contributed through their congressional committee, which I guess technically counts as a PAC, but that's, it's a little bit different. It's not a special interest PAC. How many individual donors do you have, and what is your average donation? Oh, my gosh. I don't even know those numbers right now. And uh, I've been putting up your website, so that's obviously how people can get involved with your campaign. Um, but what do you think your chances are with the DCCC jumping on the scales and, uh, you know, it being a Republican district? Well, it's not actually a Republican district. It's a district that in the primary in 2016 when for Bernie Sanders by a really decisive margin. It's a district that went for Hillary Clinton by about nine points in 2016. So what it is, is a Democratic district that is held by a particularly wily Republican politician. And one of the ways that Mike Hoffman has been able to hold the seat is he's been very assertive in reaching out to our diverse communities. And the thing that I'm excited about is my ability to do that exact same thing. I was born and raised in a working class Latino community. I speak fluent Spanish and fluent Chinese and three other languages. And I've spent my whole life living in communities of color. And I am looking forward to going into those communities and making the case that we are going to be better for those communities than Mike Kaufman and Donald Trump and their Republican allies. And so I think that's really the ticket to beating Mike Kaufman in 2018. And I'm the candidate who's best equipped to do that. And when is the primary? It's, it starts in June. We have mail-in ballots. And so uh, starting kind of the second week of June, people are going to begin mailing those ballots back in to the Colorado, I think it's Secretary of State. And the final day is June 26th. So that's, that's technically election day. But for us, June is election month. Okay, great. Well, I've been putting up your website, so if people want to get more information or they want to donate or they want to volunteer, they know where to go. 
Good luck. Great. And thank you so much for coming on the Robust Opposition. Coach Lauren, we are a people-powered campaign. We need volunteers. We need contributions. We need all of your support, even if it's only online. And I really do believe that we can win this and we can send a message to Washington that people want progressive policies and progressive representatives. And, and they are sick and tired of D.C. jumping on the scales and, and trying to put their people who are going to promote their priorities and corporate interests in power. Great. Thank you very much. Great. Good Thank luck. you so much. Have a great night. Okay, bye-bye. I am just going to close the show by uh, telling you what I'm working on for an upcoming show. Um, Sunday night, I'm going to have Carrie Gilliam. Her book is called um, Whitewash, the story of a weed killer, cancer, and the corruption of science. And it's about how Monsanto has been pretty much colluding with the regulatory agencies, specifically the EPA and the FDA, to keep out the information about glyphosate being a cancer, uh, a carcinogen, carcinogen, glyphosate being the main ingredient in Monsanto's weed killer Roundup, and how it is in so much of our food right now. So this was a real expose, and I'm really looking forward to having her on my show, and that's going to be Sunday night at 7 p.m. right here on my Facebook page. So for now, I'm going to say good night, have a great week, and keep fighting.